Hello and welcome. My name is Dr Jamie Gundry and I'm a teaching fellow in biology and wildlife at the University of Salford. As well as this, I'm a professional wildlife photographer and run workshops to Wales, the north of England, the southeast and also to Norway. In the next few months, there will hopefully be some prints of some of my images going up in the Peel Building at the University of Salford. So I decided to make a slideshow of all the possible images. There may well be some more that are added, and I certainly won't put all 65 of these on the walls, partly because there's a few of most of the animals I've included. But the aim here is to give you a snapshot of some of the really amazing animal species that you get in northern Britain. All of them can be found in North, northern England and northern Wales with the exception of the white-tailed eagle which is a personal obsession of mine and I couldn't resist including them. Firstly we have a cloud of avocets at one of the northwest's nature reserves. They're such beautiful beautiful birds with their black upturned bills. They're often really angry with one another so are nothing like as peaceful and serene as they may appear. Next we have a beautiful adult wild badger being annoyed by a couple of magpies. Badgers aren't particularly endangered, whereas the avocet is, but they are certainly imperiled by the badger cull, which has been going on for recent, in recent decades, uh, ostensibly to reduce the risk of bovine TB. It's not been particularly successful, and the, re the required culling that would actually have an effect on TB would be a huge, huge amount of mortality to badger populations, which many conservationists would argue cannot be justified. Next we have a few images of barn owls. This was on a beautiful, cold midwinter's morning, and the sun is rising directly behind but to the left of the owls. Hence you get this lovely backlighting effect of the golden light shining through the wingtips of these beautiful birds. Barn owls have incredible hearing and can find prey to an accuracy of about two degrees left or right simply using their hearing. So they can hunt in the pitch black. In fact, much of the year they do hunt in the pitch black, which is why we never see them. And for that reason, the conservation status of the barn owl in Britain is fairly unknown. They may be doing a lot better than we think, but the last piece of data I could find suggests there were, when last recorded, about 4,000 pairs in Britain. So they're far from common, but they're an incredibly beautiful sight, especially in winter when the nights are short and cold, so they often do their hunting in daylight. Next we have some black grouse. These images were taken in the Welsh hills on several dawn sessions spread over two springs, so 2019 and 2020, the latter just before the COVID lockdown. Now these are really beautiful um, birds. The males, which you'll see in these pictures, are this deep, deep blue with these red wattles on the head and white ornamental tails. And they do what's called lecking, which is that the males display at traditional parade grounds, in this case for an hour or two, maybe three hours, every morning for several weeks. And the quality of the male, as far as the females are concerned, will be denoted by the quality of the territory that he is able to keep. So it's ab absolutely exhausting. It's almost a case of last man standing. And as well as displaying their tails... Um, and fighting with one another, they make at least two different really remarkable calls, which you can hear here in the video clip, which I'm just about, which I'll put it at the end. One is this deep burbling that you can hear going on all the time, and when you see the birds, you can see their chests vibrating from this deep burbling call. And the second is a more distinct kind of rasping call, and the males m make these calls a lot as well. So there's an incredible amount of energy going on into these displays, both in terms of their fighting and their, um, and their calling. So it's a really remarkable display. There's about 5,000 male black grouse in Britain, and presumably not that different in terms of numbers of females, so they're not common. And these big lecking sites are really very special indeed. And the word lek means parade ground. 
So enjoy the audio and we'll move on to brown hairs next. Next you can see a few images of brown hares. These are relatively common and they've had a few good years in recent seasons. They're probably more abundant and easier to see in the southeast than the north. Um, they are really remarkable animals, nothing like a rabbit when you get close to them with these huge long sprinting legs. They actually have to get into quite difficult contortions to, to nibble their own feet, as you'll see in some of these pictures. Um, this, these were actually captured at a site in the south where they're really not particularly scared of people. And whereas in many hill land, hillside landscapes you get hollows in the vegetation where the sheep sleep, in this area you get smaller hollows where the hare sleep. Just beautiful to spend a few quiet hours with them. Um, they're very, very tranquil, incredibly beautiful animals. Next we have a couple of wild bumblebees um, hovering, taking nectar from bluebells in my garden in Chester. And I really, I really enjoy macro photography. I always have, um, ever since ever since I can remember, my first ever job in a, in, a, in a gap of time at university all went on buying a cheap macro lens. I've still got it, even though there's quite a lot of sand in the mechanism and I don't use it anymore. Next we have snipe. I absolutely adore these birds. They're really, really tiny, maybe 15 centimetres long plus the bill. And as you can see, the bill is very impressive. And they're known as skulking birds, which means they're very shy and very hard to see. And their camouflage is really, really spectacular. Often I'll only spot these if someone else has spotted them first, or if um, someone has mentioned that a certain hide has some snipe near it at a certain time. They stay almost motionless, um, and their camouflage is really, really beautiful. But once you do see them, they're exquisite birds. As always with wildlife photography, it helps to get down low, and the second two shots do this fairly well, but the, the first one doesn't. Um, you have to get pretty close to these. I, I can't see any reason why you couldn't try and bait them if you found there was any particular food they like. You might be able to get some lovely shots with an iPhone or something on a remote release. Yeah, well worth a try. So yeah, these beautiful, beautiful wading birds. And you'll see them, if they're not motionless, you'll see them thrumming their head up and down, pecking for little food items with that long, long bill. Next we have some common coots. Um, they're very, very different to the behaviour of a snipe. They're very aggressive and very pushy. And if a nature reserve is quite quiet and you're there with a camera, it's always worth following the most aggressive coot with the camera, with a long le with a lens, long lens if you have one, because he is the most likely bird on that lake to be picking a fight with someone and providing interesting behaviour. They're a real pain in the arse, basically, but wonderful, good, they're good fun. They will bully moorhens, they will bully other ducks. I've seen them try to bully swans, so they'll really have a go at everything, which make for, makes for some wonderful pictures. As you can see in these fighting images, they have large flattened feet for walking on vegetation and they will go attack each other with claws to try and establish dominance. So yeah, they're well worth a watch. They're good fun. Next we have some dragonflies and damselflies. These are of the order Odonata and they're a beautiful, very widespread group found all over the world and they thrive in northern Britain. Um, on the first image we have a, a real giant um, this this dragonfly in the background is probably uh, 100 millimeters in wingspan, maybe 120, and clinging onto a piece of vegetation. And in the foreground, you've got uh, the little blue damselfly, so as a male, who's come to to check the giant dragonfly out. No idea why. It's just about possible that the big dragonfly will eat the damselfly, but the little damselfly moved on very quickly. Um, this, was a, this wasn't actually a macro shot. The uh, large dragonfly was so big and quite distant that I could take this with a normal lens, but they're just beautiful things, as you can see. 
Moving on to the next shot, we've got the same species of dragonfly, this time laying eggs. Um, you can just see under the water that she is cutting a, an incision in that piece of vegetation. And she will be laying a number of eggs into it, and then she will move on. They tend to spread their eggs out over a large area. I suppose the, the cheesy phrase would be not to put all their eggs in one basket. And again, we've got a small, a male small blue damselfly just checking her out briefly. So again, we'll be looking at about a 100, maybe even 120 millimeter wingspan on that large dragonfly. Very, very beautiful. Um, they're not particularly scared of humans. Yeah, they're not going to, you know, if you try to touch one, which you should never do, it's going to fly away. But they'll be perfectly happy, maybe two or three meters from you, if you find a suitable, clean piece of um, of water without too much movement. So no, not a river, more a lake in summer. This is well worth a watch. Really spectacular. Next we have a pair of common data uh, dragonflies. The male is red and the female is yellowy gold. And in the first couple of shots they are mating. And then we can see that they continue being attached to one another, or rather the male continues holding onto the female even after mating and the reason that he's doing this is that so that no other male can inject sperm into that female he's desperate to make sure that he fathers those eggs and although these are hovering above grass a few meters from a pool it's interesting perhaps surprising that the female is beginning to release eggs while she is nigh, while she's not above water, and she's certainly not with her ovipositor in water. So, and you can see this in the final shot, the fourth shot, where a number of eggs are, if not being released, then certainly are ready for release at the back end of the female's body. These are a common species which which you can see fairly easily across clean pools of water in summer. Next we have three shots of godwits. These were taken on the Wirral um, at a nature reserve. And as with all nature reserves, you need quite a lot of patience. But the key to wildlife photography is really understanding your subject and knowing where and when to find it. And typically mornings are best, early mornings, um, and then dusk and the middle of the day can be problematic in terms of the levels of activity. Sometimes it's very quiet, and in summer, the lighting can be pretty harsh. But far better if there is activity in the middle of the day to photograph it than not to do so. And I've taken plenty of images I'm happy with in the middle of the day. Here we have a grass snake. Uh, this one was about a metre long, which I was very, very lucky to see on a dragonfly trip. I was watching, and you've just seen the pictures, I was photographing dragonflies and damselflies mating and laying eggs and fighting with one another. And this beautiful snake appeared and initially curled up very close to me and then swam right past me about eight feet away. So I just about got a few shots. Most of them are rubbish, but this one is, is sharp enough. So I just felt very, very lucky. So staying attentive and spending a long time in an area was how I got this shot. But they are beautiful, beautiful things. Um, not really sure a photo can do credit to them. And next we have a Eurasian jay. They're pretty common, very intelligent birds, um, very smart, often quite good at, at outwitting birds of prey. And this one landed very, very close to a feeder. And so um, where I was taking pictures, you can see I've just concentrated on that lovely blue stripe down the middle of the bird. The next four shots are a couple of a very cooperative kestrel and a couple of a short-eared owl. Um, both of these birds of prey are fairly common in, in northern Britain. Um, short-eared owls are beautiful, beautiful animals and they have the the, the benefits of hunting in the daytime, which is, is a massive advantage when you're photographing them compared to a barn owl or particularly a tawny owl, which you really need to use flash to photograph. So Starting with a kestrel, you can see I just slowly stalked stalk towards it and it was sitting on a fence post, tried not to stress it out and eventually got close enough. And the short-eared owls are a fabulous species that I've been lucky enough to photograph many times. And you don't get them in the northwest in the summer 
but they are common in the northwest in the winter, relatively common. And many times I've spent full afternoons seeing absolutely nothing, but occasionally you'll get one close enough for some very good shots. They are completely silent because like the barn owl, they depend on acoustic cues to find their prey. So they're totally silent, so you'll never know they're coming unless you see them. And they sort of have a lot beautiful lolloping flight across the fields as they look for voles and other rodents to eat. Into a couple of shots of kingfishers. Um, I spent a lot of the summer of 2017 doing an extended video of them, uh, looking at their, their flights and them fishing and them washing themselves. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. And it's just a privilege being with them, really. The The second shot of the the pair was taken. They were only about six metres from the hide. It's just an absolute joy to be there. These are public RSPB hides, so anyone can go there. And it takes a bit of waiting, but it's really worth it, really worth spending an afternoon in one of these hides. And if you get the timing right, the right time of the year, you've got a, a very, very high chance of seeing them. We have a couple of shots of little grebes. I love these little things. They're the size of a, of a large orange, and that's when they're fluffed up. And they spend their time diving for fish and other and invertebrates. And they're reasonably tame, but of course they have to be quite close to you because they're so small. And we've got a couple of shots here. One is of it diving, and with good light, I was able to freeze the motion of its head puncturing the surface of the water. And the other shot is of one emerging from the surface with its head dripping wet and sort of poking its head through this sort of crust of vegetation. They're very cute things. Now long-tailed tits. These tiny beautiful birds uh, weigh about 9 grams and are about 15 centimetres long. And as you can see, most of that is their tail anyway. They really are gorgeous. They are sociable and have a very complex system for finding who are their kin, who they will help, and who are not their kin, who they will not help. One of the reasons for this is because they often have expensive nest failures. If their nest has failed too late in the season, it's too late to start again. So they will find a relative and help them. And they find their relative using a kin recognition call that they learned in the nest. So beautiful, beautiful things and a real treat to see them. Indeed, eight of them in the second and third pictures. And now mallards and three contrasting shots of one of Britain's most famous and abundant wildfowl. They are they're, they're pretty common and so sometimes people ignore them but they really are beautiful animals both the brash showy males and the more subtly coloured females. And now mountain hares. These are endemic to the Scottish Highlands and unlike the brown hare are endemic to Britain as a whole whereas the brown hare was introduced by the Romans. Um, they are most common and easier to find in the Cairngorms in the eastern highlands but are also can also be found in other areas in Scotland and in the Peak District where they've been introduced. They're bigger than a rabbit, or much bigger than a rabbit, but smaller than a brown hare, and as you can see, are very insulated against the cold. The one at the back has some of its white fur already in preparation for the winter. Of course, in modern times, there is less snowfall than the white coats that they take in the winter adapt them for. And they are most visible in the spring when they're still white, but the snows have often gone. And now the river otter, Lutra lutra. These are a very famous, very charismatic species. Intrinsically, most of them are very, very shy. And in fact, the best place to see them in the whole country is in the Shetland Islands. Because, of course, the otter is as well adapted to seashores as it is to rivers. They do need to wash in fresh water about once a day. So even the marine otters, which spend their time in the sea, where there's so much to eat, will wash in a little stream roughly once every once every 24 hours. This is a baby um, and you can see it's been startled probably by an irresponsible dog walker and then it swam off and it was just a real privilege to be quite so close to them.
Sometimes they do get habituated to humans. This can be fantastic for wild watch, wildlife watching, but can often end up with lots and lots of people flooding to these sites. And I know that in one of these sites, a dog ended up attacking an otter. Now, the otter got away, but obviously this caused a huge amount of distress to the otter. So it's an interesting question as to whether habituation to humans is any good for the wildlife. And now the red fox. These are common throughout large parts of Britain, including in many cities. And along with the badger are Britain's largest land carnivores. We used to have wolves and bears and lynxes, but they were hunted to extinction in Britain in the last millennia. Uh, you can see in this picture that the badger is actually a heavier animal than the fox, and they're reasonably happy to tolerate each other's company. This is a feeding site where a lovely old man had been feeding them every other night or so for years, and you could pay him a little, little bit of money and go and watch them. It's really, really special. One of the foxes, a particularly bushy, healthy-looking male, seemed to be keeping two different families going in the local area because sometimes he would take food in one direction and sometimes he would take food in the opposite direction. He did, and he did seem to be taking a lot of food in general. So if this is true, I guess he is winning at life in Darwinian terms. They're beautiful, beautiful animals, as you can see, and well worth looking out for. Really one of the treats of British wildlife. Next is a red squirrel. You can find these in quite a lot of North, quite a few pockets of Northwest Britain and Northwest England, sorry, and they're common in parts of Scotland. Um, they were never actively exterminated in the rest of England, but the invasive grey squirrel car carries a disease called squirrel pox, which leaves the grey squirrel relatively uninfected but is very bad indeed for the health of the red squirrel. So that is why they do not thrive in most of England. These are a species which you could definitely try and photograph with an iPhone or a cheap compact camera or something like that because they are easily attracted by nuts. And so if you were to find a one of the squirrel sites in the northwest, you could, as long as you didn't invade their space or cause them stress, you could perhaps get some very good pictures with an iPhone and a supply of peanuts. Next we're moving back to wildfowl and a few shots of a number of common and in some cases not so common but beautiful species that you can see in Northern Britain. The first of these is the moorhen, fairly abundant on lots of lakes. Its behaviour is a little bit like that of a small subordinate coot but they're very distinctive to look at. These have got red and yellow markings, whereas the coot has that distinctive white head. So lovely, lovely animals. In this case, one is having a wash, but you'll also see them running across the surface, looking after their cute fluffy chicks in spring and summer, and defending their territory, sometimes with some fairly vicious fights. Next, the pintail. These are quite rare. They're very rare in summer, with only 10 to 30 breeding pairs in Britain. Uh, but there can be up to 30,000 individuals overwintering. And for these reasons, Britain is an important overwintering site for them. And they have an amber conservation status, according to the RSPB. It is legal to shoot these in winter. So this is obviously a problem for their conservation, legal in the UK, that is. But they're quite distinctive, and pin, the word, word pintail refers to their beautiful long tail, as you can see. Moving on now, we come to the potchard, and these can form large flocks in winter and are particularly spectacular in winter sun. Following that, we have the shoveler. This is a large duck which, with a long shovel-shaped beak, hence the name. And these couple of photos were taken in the spring as the males are starting to pay more and more attention to the females. And this female is trying to get away from a large group of males. Probably my favourite duck is the tufted duck, which you can see here. They've got this wonderful personality. They're very small and the males have these vibrant black and white colours with a purple tint to the head and these bright yellow eyes. Just 
but well worth a watch. As with many photographic opportunities, and this is a bad example of it, it's good to get low. And I've had a lot of fun lying on the gravel in nature reserves in the northwest of England, trying to get very low shots of these birds. And this means that you drop the foreground entirely out of focus. So the subject sits totally isolated from the foreground and the background. Now we have a water rail. There are only about 1,100 breeding pairs of, the, of this in the UK, and they're, they're a real treat. A bit very similar to a moorhen, but much classier looking, I think. After this, we have one of Britain's, one of the world's most splendid animals, which is the puffin. This is the Atlantic puffin, and there are nearly 600,000 breeding pairs in the UK, but they are declining rapidly in the north of their range, and particularly in Iceland, which used to have nearly 2 million breeding pairs. What people who have never seen them before often don't realise is quite how small they are. They're the size of a pint of ale, maybe a little bit smaller than that, and only weigh about 400 grams. This is actually quite heavy for a bird this small, and as a result they have to flap their wings incredibly fast. To see them in flight is like a colourful brick with wings. However, they thrive underwater and can dive down to depths of about 180 metres to find their food. Sometimes they will hunt up to 20 kilometres, maybe even 30 kilometres, from their breeding colonies in order to bring in abundant food, particularly sand eels, for their young. This is a daunting prospect and requires a huge amount of energy and time. And in southwest Wales, for example, we know that a pair in, as a whole brings in about 10 trips of fish per day for their chick. So that could represent well over 100 kilometres of flight per day. To add to their cuteness is the fact that one of their calls sounds like a very deep-throated, angry donkey. They really are very, very special animals. Next we have the white-tailed eagle. In all honesty, these do not currently live in northern England, um, but they are fairly common in the Western Highlands and on Mull and Skye. Moderately common in Fife in eastern Scotland, and a recent reintroduction has begun on the Isle of Wight. One of them spent a winter hanging out with the red kites in Oxfordshire. These are really spectacular birds with a wingspan of up to 2.5 metres, a weight of up to 6 kilos, a huge meat cleaver type beak and very, very strong long talons about the size of a small adult human's hand. I have seen them many times in the west of Scotland, but every year I make one or two trips to Flatanger in Norway where they really are very, very abundant. And you can see them scooping fish from the sea very near the boat, 10 or 20 or even 30 times a day. The white-tailed eagle is a massive conservation success story. They were hunted to extinction in both Britain and Ireland in the first decade of the 20th century. And from the 1970s to the 1980s, 80 eagles were introduced on the island of Rum off the west coast of Scotland. These were Norwegian eagle chicks who had been removed from Norwegian nests. Normally eagles lay an extra egg. So this wasn't a major cost to the population. And from the 90s onwards, eagles began breeding once again on the west coast of Scotland. And there are now more than 100 pairs. So the population is probably reasonably healthy in the west, in the west coast of Scotland, which is wonderful, wonderful news. They remain vulnerable to landowners poisoning or shooting birds. This is, of course, illegal, but can be readily covered up sadly, if a landowner has access to a large amount of land. The reintroduction in Ireland has suffered from considerable numbers of, of, wild, of introduced wild eagles being killed by landowners. Now I'll stop talking for a bit and you can enjoy a couple of different sequences of eagles diving to take fish from the surface of the sea.
Next we have a couple of garden spiders. The first one is Britain's commonest jumping spider called the zebra spider. He is sitting on a garden chair. So this was photographed, you know, in my garden. And you can see the wood grain in the picture. You can see quite how small he is. He is about seven or eight millimeters long. Yet he has fangs of two or three millimeters long. And he's capable of jumping something like a hundred millimeters. So these are incredibly agile, effective killers at a semi-microscopic scale. The next image is another beautiful spider that I photographed in the northwest. I wanted to finish this video showing you some deer images, not just because these are common and glamorous species which are quite easy to see, but also because they show the benefits of getting up very early and staying out very late. The first image is a pair of roe deer gently trotting away from me at dawn in a local nature reserve. And the final two images are a wild red deer stag photographed long after dusk. I've included this to show that with abundant, fairly easy to find wildlife, you can get very, very distinctive images with very distinctive colors and contrasts if you hang out and stay out after dusk. Now, in all, not in all places is this safe, but I've certainly had remarkable times at and after dusk with red deer. This brings me to the end of the slideshow, and as I said, several of these images should go up in the Peel Building at the University of Salford sometime in late 2020 or early 2021. One may think of wildlife photography as very, very solitary, and it certainly often is. However, it's not all completely asocial. So I'd like to thank the following for their company and warmth and enthusiasm on the many trips, be it to hides or walks or on boats, where I took these images. Thank you very much, all of you.